Nancy Oakley from Willowbank Preservation School in Ontario, and I have her on the call because we're going to be talking about um, designing um, preservation methods for uh, historic buildings. Um, so I'd like to introduce Scott Bishop, who's going to tell us about um, designing uh, public areas and ecosystems um, that benefit the, um, the environment around them. Um, Scott is a landscape architect and founding principal of Bishop Land Design, and he is also a professor of practice in urban landscape and sustainable urban environments at the School of Architecture at Northeastern University. Um, in the past, he's also been a visiting cr critic and teacher at Syracuse University, the University of Puerto Rico, and the University of Pennsylvania School mm -hmm. of, of Design. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been great to drive around and over a few mountains today from between here and Boston. Uh, good to see dirt roads again on occasion. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a landscape architect, uh, but I'm also a human ecologist. Uh, a lot of people don't even know what a landscape architect is, and then I tell them, hey, I'm a human ecologist, and that just makes things even more confusing. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. I got my degree from human ecology from College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine. Uh, and uh, as we know, as we all learn in life, you just keep on adding knowledge, you don't take it away. And so even though I have a master's degree in landscape architecture, I still think a lot about how we deal with human ecology. And uh, what does that really mean? So humans, uh, that's, that's us, right? That's the species Homo sapiens sapiens. Eco means home, and then logi, or logic. So those are the three things that really make up human ecology. So it's about how we understand the relationship between humans and the environment. We can think about how other animals relate within the environment, but we actually only know what our relationship is with the environment. It's kind of a philosophical thing. Um, and so that can be very interesting. Things are complex in the living world. Uh, in the built world or in architecture, we sometimes put bubbles around things, and that means that we're not thinking about the way, uh, the way that the living things create complex structures, right? There's still actually architectures that exist uh, between living things. This is a food web of how a cod is built, right? So it takes all of these relationships in, in the world to create a cod. Right? And as you take those things away or you alter those things in the environment, you can get rid of the cod or you can make more cod. So these are, this is actually how it happens. The interesting thing about this, and this is what I tell my students, is that this is in relationship uh, to uh, not only the things that are in the water, but also the things that are in the air. So an ecological system is complex and it grows. It's uh, seeming like it never ends. Um, our relationship with the environment is even more complex than a food web because we're interacting with all of these things. These are network diagrams. I teach my students how to draw these so they can understand uh, the relationships in the natural environment, but how we interact with them as humans, right? So this is looking at uh, a fire regime and how we have stopped and started that fire regime and it has different cause and effect relationships. Uh, as evident as the wildfires that exist in California, right? Uh, this one happens to be looking at wildfires in the front range of Colorado. The thing is, is like, this is pretty much the end of that system. We get energy from the sun, so that helps us out quite a bit, uh, which helps all the living things on the planet, but we don't really get off of this thing too much. We kind of throw some stuff up there but there's really not people on those. Every once in a while, a couple people go to the moon. But with, more or less, this is a closed system. And whatever we do here, right, it kind of stays on here and it starts to affect us uh, in one way or another, beneficial or not. Sometimes it's hard for us to judge what that is. Uh, what we do know is we have a huge impact on the planet. This is what we look like from space, right? We are impacting the planet writ large. Right, so obviously we, st we have to start to think about that. Uh, and that's where that logic comes in, in human ecology, right? Because if we aren't gonna use our intelligence, uh, we're gonna end up like these guys, not a lot of brains and bacteria, 
and if left to their own devices, they are going to shit themselves to death in that Petri dish, right? That's a closed system as well. So my goal uh, as a professor and a practitioner is to help to realize what those systems are and to create beneficial systems. Uh, we have to figure out ways that we can uh, think about what we're doing so that we don't end up in situations that are irreversible. Uh, some, some are almost already there at that point, so we have to figure out how we actually reverse some of those things. Uh, and so part of that, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you some parallels here uh, about some of the work that I do at Northeastern in the Sustainable Urban Environments Program and how that impacts some of my work out there in the real world. Uh, so we can look at certain things. These may seem like pretty much non sequiturs. This is a Abyssinia maritima. It's a gray mangrove. Uh, that's napalm. That's a shrimp, and that's a pregnant woman, right? What are the relationships between those, right? That's one of the things that we explore. So they're each given 10 topics in ecology, very broad. They look at an urban area or a series of urban areas that are captured by a region. Uh, this one, it happens to be the region of the Mekong Delta. Uh, and then we look at how energy flows through those systems, right? Because really ecology is just the study of thermal dynamics in living things, right? Ecology is, is actually mathematical. It is a science. People think that it's just made up. <laughs> but it's actually a science. So we look at how energy flows through systems. And we can then trace our own behaviors within those systems. Uh, so this particular um, student uh, was trying to trace the impacts of the Vietnam War on the Mekong Delta ecology. So that's one of the things that we ask as an ecologist, like what are we doing? So don't just do something, think about what are we doing, what is the practice of what we do, and, and where and how are we doing it? Uh, it's hard sometimes for architects to think that way because our practice is based on basically going, okay, this is a chair, this is how a chair is built, I can build a chair anywhere in the world, and that's what I'm gonna do. And that's, I mean, that's why it's called archi, right? It's a, an off of archetype, and texture, which is, is the thing. So, thinking about that more specifically actually helps us understand what's happening. So, what she looked at was the impact of, of that particular war, not on the human population, but on the ecology itself. Uh, so we go through a mapping exercise. What you can see here are the orange areas are areas where they use Agent Orange to clear the forest. Uh, and the white area is where carpet bombing occurred uh, in that area. So those are two major impacts. If you look at the scale of this map, right, this is really the whole Mekong Delta. And so that's a, that's a massive amount of destruction that's occurring to an ecological system. All right, so back to the network diagram, which helps us trace what actually happened. Because we could say, well, well whatever, we, we left there, we made some mistakes, mistakes were made, and we, we took off. Um, but uh, in looking at this more specifically in terms of the relationship, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead you through this, obviously deforestation happened due to the Agent Orange as well. Uh, the bombing, which was massive, created these kind of crater conditions, uh, which meant that it actually, once the war was done, the ecology of this entire area was altered. Not only were the mangroves disappeared, what followed in succession was actually this guy, this fern. This is just, it's kind of a saltwater fern, and it's actually habitat for mud shrimp. All right, the mud shrimp uh, started breeding quite a bit due to that, and that's a food source. So uh, shrimp farming was not a huge thing in Vietnam until after the Vietnam War, and then people started farming it because the habitat for that shrimp existed due to the bombing. As well, they started actually creating fish ponds out of the bomb craters from the carpet bombing. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, those are two things that carry with them a lot of different chemicals. Agent Orange, as we all know, is straight up a contagion, uh, a cancer-causing agent, as well as a neurological agent. Um, and carpet, uh, carpet bombing contains all the explosive. Explosives also contain a lot of bad chemicals. Everybody knows this, even the people that make them. 
Uh, and so those end up in the environment. Uh, interestingly enough, because of the way that we altered that environment, uh, it led to this increase of farming in Vietnam, right? We weren't really interacting with that uh, until recently, and you can see here that the number one uh, importer of Vietnamese shrimp happens to be the United States, right? So what do you think those shrimp contain? That's right, they contain the results of our own war. We're eating our own war, right? It's a little bit ironic. All right, so how do we change that? And that's what I'm interested in. Because you can stop there and you can beat yourself up and you can say, I hate humans, I'm done with humans, and that's no good either, right? Self-loathing is not actually a good thing. So how do we change, how do we make things productive? So by utilizing these mappings, we can actually look, look for ways that we actually start to reverse that. Uh, and that's something that's really, 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 really critical. How is it that we start to think about productivity? And so uh, what she looked at is how can we restore the mangrove ecology, but they are still dependent upon, right, that economy uh, to support their country. So in a way, you have to think about how we hybridize our own, how we live on this planet, uh, as well as how we actually think about creating change. So a lot of this is really about how you start to basically create very, very tight rows of mangroves. Mangroves are like super, super productive plants. They can uptake, they can fight or remediate in situ. They can pull up most of the contamination that we see, both uh, from the Agent Orange and the dioxins from the bombs. And so in doing that, you're also stabilizing the condition. Their natural fish stock declined rapidly because of that, because of that situation. Mangroves are nurseries to basically tropical fish. All right, so how is it that we kind of insert that? And so my students go through a series of trying to understand within the landscape, what is the scale that we could interact in? How is it that we kind of mix the shrimp, the mangroves, and the rice? What would be the ordination of those things all together? Uh, and then we think about, and these are, these are really conceptual exercises, uh, but we know that these things exist, so uh, this is heavily research-based. And then we can start to say, all right, this is something that you'd probably want to look into if you're super in interested in this uh, facet. Otherwise, it's a, it's a point of learning, understanding how we, how we interact in the world. All right, and then further, trying to understand how we interrelate with environments, right? We can say, this area should be left alone. That's great, but unfortunately, the things that we impact are at a much larger scale. So it's actually more beneficial that we think about how we live within those systems and create productive systems. So building as we are, right? We are, uh, we are part of this earth. How is it that we interact with those systems? Uh, and so this leads me to some of the work that I've done, uh, which is very much looking beyond what is just happening on a site. So the landscape architect, you're given like a site. Here's a site. All right, you go and make your cool thing and then walk away, <laughs> thank you very much. It's not yours anymore, uh, which some of that's still true. It's hard to give up projects. Uh, but this uh, particular site, um, this almost all of my sites have a checkered past, as you might imagine. This, <laughs> this one was both a, uh, this was all landfill, so this was once an estuary. This is between Lake Michigan and the Milwaukee River. Um, and it was also an incinerator at one point. Uh, it also had coal piles, it was a stockpile for material. Um, and we were given this project to think about how we would create a place um, in this situation uh, that would get people to the waterfront and it became a, a kind of the first project that helped to instigate redevelopment of this area called the Third Ward, which is now completely done. Uh, so as a way to instigate development, but also a way for us to think about ecology. And in doing so, uh, we were very interested in having people interact. That's one of the things that I do as a human ecologist. You have to see that. Yeah, you guys do it all the time, right? But within the urban environment, it's much more difficult to find the great things that you guys have around you, right? So understanding how that interaction occur is gonna help to educate people. 
Um, but also the ordination of species that exist here are a direct relationship to the uses that had occurred and thinking about how we make productivity happen. So you can see that there's poplars in the foreground here. Those are helping to remediate that site. Uh, they're helping to clean it. And then lower down, you have a marsh. That marsh never, ever existed there. That is not restoration ecology. That's the creation of an ecological system. We created that, uh, we cut down the sheet pile wall, we let water come into that site, and we let water flow off of the site. So we're opening up that ecological system. And, and that was really the narrative of this, besides the fact that we understand as landscape architects that uh, seasonal change is really, really critical. Um, and that those leaves, right, that detritus, that's also an important part of how eco ecological systems happen. So when you mow your lawn, you clean it up, and you throw in a big pile to compost it, that's fine. But uh, you're not letting the whole system complete itself. So working on this, as well as snow melt uh, and other factors, right? So we, we created the steel marsh. You can see here that's, that we actually cut into that sheet pile. Uh, that keeps the wave action down, but allows the water to flow through. This is when we first planted what we call the steel marsh. Uh, and this is what happened over time. So thinking about productivity in a way that's different, allowing people to interact with it. So it's not just about creating a marsh, it's about how you create a glowing bench that draws people to that marsh to sit in that marsh and think about what's happening. Um, and then this guy showed up. So this was something that was super curious. Um, does anybody know what this is? Just wondered. The yellow perch. Uh, so the Milwaukee River is pretty polluted. One of the things that we did that was really cool with that project is that we pumped water out of the, out of the river onto the site because it's nutrified. There's just like basically a bunch of CSOs, combined sewer overflows, because it's an older city that go into that river. So by pumping that water up from the river and using it as irrigation, plants are loving that. It's like basically <laughs> like natural fertilizer, right? It's the greenest grass of any project that I have. Uh, but also you're stripping those nutrients out, so we're, we're using the entire site as a filter. But as that water went down the site, what happened is, is that all of the seeds, all of, that, um, all of that clean water makes its way out of those slits that we cut in there. And this is not something that we actually thought about. Um, and this guy showed up, the yellow perch. Yellow perch is super, super sensitive to pollution. It shouldn't be there. It shouldn't be there at all because that river is way too polluted. But for whatever reason, because we were cleaning that site and it was an open ecological system, people were pulling these right out, right out on the other side of that sheet pile wall. So there's ways that we can make it better. That's the big story there. But also thinking about how that happens. So you know, that circle of learning that takes place, can we actually think about ways to do that, to, to design that? Uh, and that's really what I thought about in this particular project. I'm like, okay, so now I can think about this entire kind of system. Let's think about the riverine ecology. Let's think about how the fish are working. Think about that relationship between the terrestrial and the aquatic. Uh, this is Grand Rapids, Michigan. We did a lot of planning work there along the river and in their downtown, looking to create like basically two huge, uh, two huge river parks along the entire city but having to figure out ways to do that because there's obviously already development that goes right up to the edge. Um, they have fluctuations of about seasonally of about 20 feet. Um, within, so there's a high velocity of that river. Um, so this was the thing that I started to research um, in my own practice, which was like, how do, we, how do we build that? So there's all of these relationships between the terrestrial environment and then basically these bigger fish, right? So how do we build a better fish? Uh, and what we found out is that the little shredders, the little microbes, all that stuff, uh, if you get the right kind of tree species, in the fall, when the fish are running to spawn, steelhead, which is a big fish that comes here through the Great Lakes uh, and then up the river, that uh, they'll drop that detritus, they'll drop that in the, in the river and the little microbes that are hanging on that leaf, the little, little shredders, all those guys, they fall into the water column. The fish don't eat while they're breeding. 
Uh, and so the best way to feed a fish while they're spawning is to actually get those microbes into the water column so as they breathe, they're actually eating. And so we could set up that system along this river corridor so that if we found the right species that had the right, the right critters on them, that basically we would be feeding that fish, right? Which builds a better fish, it's bu which builds a better ecological system, right? The upward mi migration, it's like building a better cod. Same idea, right? Uh, and so this is the project that I'm currently working on. It's called Lion's Edge. There's actually a plaza component to it as well. But it's allowing people also to interact with this riverine environment. It does a lot of things. Uh, it does things in four seasons as well. That's one of the things that I really try to highlight in my work is understanding and getting people out even when the weather's crappy. <laughs> but in order to build, uh, in order to build trees within a flood wall that has to, have to, has to at least on a yearly basis deal with 20 feet of change, and within a 100-year flood has to deal with nearly 30 feet of flooding, right, from the base elevation, uh, we have to be really, really crafty about how we actually build this because trees don't naturally want to grow in concrete walls that are four feet thick, right? So this is a structure that we have to build in order to create that habitat. It's a complex project, not only from its components and parts, but also from the way that it operates. So uh, <coughs> these are actually taxodiums. They, aren't, they haven't been living in Michigan at least for, I don't know, the past like uh, 10 million years. But people ask me, are they native? And I'm like, yes, they are. <laughs> they have been there before, right? Like, uh, well, how do we classify that? Is that something that we classify by the last glacial period or anyway? Regardless, the point is, is that these are really big workhorses. Uh, they also help to fight or remediate. They, you know, just like any plant, they're a carbon sink, right? They're gonna convert carbon dioxide, especially that, those in the urban environment, to sugars and starches that help build the tree, and they're gonna release oxygen. It's one of the coolest things about trees is that they actually make the stuff that we breathe. <laughs> uh, and then they also create a rhizosphere that creates a, another level of, of microbial activity. So how do we bring life back to urban soils? It's by having big trees. Uh, those needles, as I talked about before, they flow down the terraces that we created and they go right into the river. We aren't stopping that, we're not putting that in the sewer, we're allowing that water to flow openly in, into the ecological, into the larger ecological processes. And so this all works, right? It all works together uh, to basically help feed a fish. Uh, it also polishes and cleans stormwater. We're taking the water off of the roofs in the surrounding plaza area. We're putting that in a cistern and we're using that for irrigation. Uh, and as it works its way down, there are no points where the, where the hardscape allows the water to run off without intercepting a terrace. This is, a, it's actually more complex than this now, but this is our first attempt at understanding how we would create a structure so that we could have these terraces, but also allow for a root volume. Trees need uh, approximately 1,800 square uh, cubic feet of soil in order to be a big tree, uh, unlike what you see in the urban area where they give them like a six by six tree pit, that's not enough, right? So we had to convince everybody that's uh, like, you gotta build a flood wall and you gotta build it big, say no, actually what we have to do is build an ecology and then build a flood wall around it, right? You change the hierarchy. What we see so often today is that there's one problem, it floods, and the answer is make it a big wall. And that's actually creating more problems because you haven't asked the, you haven't asked the right question. So much of what I ask my students to do, right, is to ask the right questions. How do we go about this? How do we understand the complexities? Because if you just do a one-to-one, -one, you're always gonna get the wrong answer. Uh, and so this is, this is a very, very complex system, but not only uh, are we lifting up that entire terrace system, uh, we're allowing for that, this thing to function in a manner that the flood wall does as well. It's also allowing that water to get filtered as it floods. So you can see here, uh, it actually deals with a 100-year floodplain. It doesn't look like the other flood walls. It actually allows people to ha inhabit this place as well. 
it allows the trees to grow, and it allows people to experience this, so it's a lot of programming that we can fit in a fairly small space, allowing people to utilize that river as a gateway. And they're looking at restoring that entire river, taking out all the dams, uh, and creating a whitewater course. So this becomes the gateway to the downtown from that particular course. All right, so back to some of the work that my students do. So this, these are my landscape architecture students and my architecture students. We do something called comprehensive design, where we basically look at large sites. This is the Boston area, in case you don't recognize it. And these, right, so this is basically, I won't touch it. This is like downtown Boston. But these are some of the bigger open spaces that still exist in and around Boston. Very, very critical, right? Um, it has, Boston has some of the largest green spaces adjacent to urban areas uh, in North America. So uh, the idea is that we will think about these areas. Some of them are compromised, some of them are being developed, and we use a team where they think together about how they solve some of these problems, not only from a landscape perspective, but an architecture perspective. So how is it that these things become interrelated? Uh, and so this is one example of this. This is uh, Katie and Molly's project. Uh, this is right uh, on the riverfront near Boston, one of the areas where you have, you know, what you see happening in Boston now is you have gentrification and a lot of residential development, but it's amongst a bunch of, of industrial landscapes, right? It's still a mix that's occurring. And this is one of those big areas. This is actually close to where the big Wynn Casino is going. Uh, and, but it's also a fuel depot for the, for the airport. Uh, and what, what we do is they take a building type so that you would say um, they had, I believe they had wood frame construction, I'm almost positive, and then they get one species and then they have to figure out how that species ecology might fit into a building system. Uh, so they got populace uh, uh, and I give them hybrid popular, not deltoidy, uh, right? So that's basically an aspen species. What happens uh, with poplars is that they're, they're the workhorse. So they can be used for pulp, they can be used for creating lumber, super fast growing tree. You can grow a 100 foot tree in a hybrid poplar in 10 years. Uh, and so they studied ways that you can distribute uh, grid systems based upon how you might grow these trees for different uses. Uh, and they also started to understand the ecology. And so what they were doing was trying to figure out how they could fight or remediate that large site that we were showing. Uh, and this shows the timeline by which they might do that. <clears throat> As well, they thought about different site strategies, right? So not only can you just do the one thing where you create a poplar forest, but you can actually use different species that are intercropping to take <coughs> care of different contamination. Uh, and they put that over time so we can understand a reasonable timeline for cleaning up a site. Uh, and then where those things might happen in relationship to where future development might occur, uh, trying to make sure that the uses match the level of remediation that needs to happen. They then get down to a site-specific exercise where they really look at a building typology and a landscape that surrounds that typology and trying to understand really how that all works together uh, because there's so much waste in the processing of a poplar uh, for either wood or uh, even just taking it down because it's being fight or remediated, they thought of a way that they could actually harness the energy that exists uh, uh, during composting to help power the site. So it really becomes a programmatic driver. Uh, they were thinking about how you could actually, you know, what, how big would the site need to be in order to start to create some of those relationships that occur. Uh, and then how would you start to create a building that relates to that specific landscape? So this kind of, this area here is actually the compost area. And you can draw heat from the compost, but then heats the building. The building itself is made out of poplars that were harvested over 10 years. And then we look at those energy systems and see how they relate. You can use the poplars to shade the structure itself, creating insulated values, as well as keeping out uh, southern sunlight. Uh, and so this whole thing becomes an exercise in trying to understand how two things that aren't related may become relatable uh, and help to create a better understanding about how you build. 
in the world. Okay, so maybe you want to know about how I build in the world. Uh, this is one of the projects that I worked on as well. This is in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's a city deck. Uh, it's actually kind of like their, their central park. Uh, they, um, they took an area which was a bunch of these, these two buildings were warehouses. Uh, that was a defunct uh, rail line. There was no relationship between the water and the side of the city. And so we helped them figure out ways that they could create that relationship again. That's super, super critical in how we think about human ecology. Just get to pe people don't even know that the river is there, right? Like get people to realize that there's something there and then it becomes an asset. And this has helped fuel the growth of their downtown. The series of platforms that are wood uh, on piles that go out into the river um, and also create uh, programmatic areas, really critical for people to have events. They have over 300 events here now every year, uh, and they also allow people to go from their boats up, uh, up to the different restaurants in the city, as well as back down uh, from the city into the water. And so pretty successful. Um, I like wood, you guys like wood from Yastramara for obvious reasons, right? Like this stuff helps us out in terms of the planet. Um, and the more that we can use wood, uh, the, the more that we start to get a handle on uh, really what is a practice of gardening, right? Forestry is a practice of gardening. And so understanding those relationships become really important. Uh, this is, this is um, sustainable um, hardwoods, but it's still being shipped around the world, right? So these are the things that we start to think about. How do we... I, you know, we do something once, we do it the best that we can, and then we think about how we did it, and we evaluate it, and we go, can we do that any better? Because there are other ways that we can do that. Uh, and so, again, you can see these kind of cool forms, but there's also, each of these benches intercepts uh, storm water in a similar way that the terraces did in Grand Rapids, and they, uh, they make sure that the water is polished in the soil before it goes into the river. So even though this is all hardscape, there is a biological function that's occurring just underneath the surface. And the relationship is then created, right? And then people understand water in a different way and they become champions of that water, right? And you create that positive, that net positive gain. Uh, again, critical in human ecology. And then that relationship uh, continues to grow as well as it relates to the identity of the city. Uh, so this one, this little guy here, uh, is one of the first projects that we started out at Bishop Land Design. And uh, I actually, is a, is a park, it's a little uh, playground in my neighborhood. So the way, the way that I got this project is I went to the community meeting and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll design that. I'll do the concept design for free because it's in my neighborhood and I can't stand somebody else <laughs> <laughs> replacing that park. So we went, we worked with the community, which are, are my neighbors, right? Uh, and we figured out how we're gonna program this. So this is, is another critical component of human ecology. And that's how we, how we create outreach. Like how do we actually talk about this? It's not just about what I wanna do as a designer, it's about how we think about programming. Programming comes from the people, right? It comes from the people that are surrounding that area. It comes from the people that know what the constraints are. And so as, as the process goes, try to figure out what that is. So uh, there's a series of landforms uh, that we look to create, but we also, the interesting kind of outcome of this is that this whole thing was uh, just fenced off. So if you're in an urban environment and you have a fenced off area and there's some lawn in it, some wood chips and some playground equipment, what do you think is gonna go and live in there? Dogs, not kids, right? And once the dog, people are gonna just let their dog in there and they're gonna walk away. They're my neighbors, I know they're doing it, I know the dogs, but I'm not there, I'm not there to, to say that's bad, it's just that that's a common use. When you put up a fence, it's just it's gonna be the response in an urban environment. So what we said is take the fence down. This isn't for, this is a playground, it's not for dogs. <coughs> You can, you can walk your dog anywhere. You can walk your dog in this park. You just can't leave it off lead. Uh, and so how is it that we do that? How is it that we create an area for kids? This is a two to five year old playground. It's for really little kids. Uh, how is that we do that? 
without having sensors. So we came up with this idea. Uh, here you can kind of see that translation of that plan into, into the park itself. And then you can see these two areas as control points. So you figure, how fast can a two-year-old run? Like, not that fast. And you should be there, right? A parent should be there. If you have a two- to five-year-old, you don't, like, just put them in the fence and walk away, right? You're going to be sitting there watching them. And so we figured out a way that, that we can use these control points uh, and still allow people to um, view their kids. Uh, and this was the thing that we created. Not only is it a fence, but it's also a bench, so we call it the fench, <laughs> right? And this fench surrounds the play area. It leaves the rest of the other areas open, right? Good ecological lesson right there. Uh, and it allows these kids to interact uh, and their parents to actually have a place to sit. Right now it's super hot, there's nowhere to sit. Uh, so it's kind of unpleasant for parents uh, and it was covered in dog crap. So we had to solve those problems. This is the fence uh, and this goes to the idea of like what we build, right? So we basically, in our office, uh, we use 3D modeling software. And we're like, okay, so how, you know, how is it that we're gonna, how is it that we're gonna think about this? So we start out with this concept, pretty easy. In fact, this was the concept right here. I have a sketch of this. It's just like, I wanna make this little thing, super simple. That is self-supporting as long as you attach it to a foundation. Uh, and then we can do all these other cool things with the different pieces that will create the form that we want to. Uh, and so we, all right, draw it once, draw it as a line drawing. <clears throat> then, I have my, then I have people in my office, we actually build prototypes before we even go into other drawings. So, okay, what did you think this was really gonna do? Oh, I thought it was gonna be like this, this, and this. Okay, go ahead, go and build it. All right, uh, that's not working, because this doesn't go like that, and this doesn't, yeah, because there's no gravity in 3D modeling software, right? <laughs> Uh, there's, there's none of the forces, like you have to model forces in a 3D model if you want to understand forces. Uh, but it's just as easy for us to actually think about it. So in the process of this, which is our prototype, uh, and these are some of my employees standing around it going, yeah, we finally built a little piece of it. <laughs> uh, we basically create these, right? These are shot drawings. Uh, which is something that most landscape architecture offices do not create, right? You just send that sketch that I showed you in the beginning, you send that to somebody else. Obviously, it's a little bit more detailed than that. You send some version or iteration of this thing, uh, and then your woodworker is going to create that shot drawing or whoever that goes to, but we actually create them ourselves. Uh, and we have manufacturing partners that we use, and then it goes, it all goes to a different company, uh, which I also own, but either way. Uh, it's a way to port this thing to make sure we get exactly what we want. Uh, and so these are just examples of the detailed shot drawings. So these go down to pieces. These go down to, right, understanding exactly how each one of the pieces are cut. So all of those letters respond to a schedule. And those have exact cut marks. They all have exact cut angles. It shows how it's attached to the foundation. And in fact, it goes down to uh, angles, lengths, uh, this is about 250 pages, uh, and it even tells you the parts and pieces. It's like an Ikea catalog, right? These are the, these are the things that you need. Uh, and then it goes to our manufacturing partners, right? And we go and we visit them, and we're like, okay, do you get what we're saying? Are you evaluating this right? How many mistakes do we make? We go back, we change the drawings a little bit. We send it back to them, so it's back and forth in terms of that process. Uh, so we start building these pieces. They're actually segmented, so in case one piece gets ruined, they can pull it out of the entire system and get a new piece made and go back to it. Because these benches are kind of long, you'll see. All right, so this is, the, this is one of them going together. Gotta have, the, gotta have the guys on site. So here's the problem, when you build something that's exact, you have to make sure the foundation is actually gonna match the thing. That is, the guys that were manufacturing this were about a thousand miles away from where it was gonna be installed. Ideally, that's not the way we would do it, right? But this is the way that the world works. Uh, 
And so <clears throat> we had to actually go and check that foundation like six different times, make sure the elevation was right, make sure the shape would match the exact thing that was gonna end up on site. Uh, and then you can see the thing coming in little piece by piece here. Uh, and they all kind of get lined up. Those guys line them up. And you're like, oh, no, you can, the, the nice thing about this particular form is you can tell when you screw up. <laughs> <laughs> Always a great little trick in design. Uh, and then you can see how this thing all goes together. Uh, this is a special kind of treated wood. Uh, and it also is treated with a natural penetrating stain that is uh, created from, uh, it's like an orange-based uh, thinner and a tongue oil combination. Uh, you can eat it, basically. You can drink it if you wanted to. Uh, <laughs> it would taste really bad. Uh, and then you can see the playground equipment within this. We're still in progress of planting. It was so hot this summer that we didn't get the, the planting done in time. Uh, and then you can see the kind of total form coming together. So that's from soup to nuts, right? Uh, and so I'm going to so leave. The, yeah. What's the playground surface? Uh, that is that is ba poured in place rubber. Mm -hmm. It's basically a combination of recycled tires, and then there's a the colored top coat, which is um, native. There's another material that we're looking at using. So again, this is about like how you kind of create your palette. There's another material that we've been exploring that's a grass mat, which allows for you to grow something in between, but it still has a fall zone. A lot of the issues that we deal with, and we can probably get into this in the Q&A, is just how you deal with code versus how you deal with sustainable materials and execution. Uh, and so uh, this particular playground uh, at least the playground portion just opened up a couple weeks ago. Uh, and that's how long it takes to actually go from design to building things. It's a long time. The city deck project that I showed you before, that took seven years of my life to build that one. Uh, so uh, when we think about this is another, another group of folks uh, that we're, we're in the comprehensive design studio. And I like to end with this just because uh, it's a way to think about like how we interact with the world again writ large. Uh, one of it is like choosing the site, right? We shouldn't always be choosing the sites that are like the green field sites, the sites that are easy. We should actually be thinking about how we choose the hard sites. So they chose a site that's actually like a huge landfill, uh, and they thought about how we could actually start to process the landfill itself by utilizing a building as a filtration system. Uh, and in essence, it's a really cool idea and it's based in a lot of research. There's, a, there's work now that's being done where they're injecting things into landfills. The problem with landfills is they're, they're just a big, um, they're just a big taco, right? A big burrito and you can't get anything in there and so it just sits in there, nothing's happening. Leachate collects on the bottom. You get some gas from processing, but you could make that much more, uh, much more reactive. So they found a, a few examples of research papers where they were injecting water and sugars and things like that into the landfill itself. And that was creating tons of natural gas, but also the, the leachate was then coming out of the landfill. And eventually this is gonna actually clean the landfill itself. All the things that were in the landfill would be processed via biological mechanisms. But as you're doing that, they thought of this building that then would capture that. So you can see the retention area, they're capturing storm water, injecting it into the landfill. They're allowing the leachate to come in to be processed into the building. They're exchanging the heat to actually heat that particular building. Uh, and then uh, they're allowing that water once processed to flow into the landscape, right? That open system. Uh, and how light itself is creating the capacity to process the leachate and how, uh, how they cool the building via this process. Uh, and again, these are very, very conceptual ideas, but they also help the next generation. And these guys actually called me. He says, I'm working on a project where we're doing a building on a landfill. And I actually started to use some of the ideas that I learned in this class, which I don't know where else they're teaching this stuff 
but uh, I'm glad that he's actually interacting in the world with that knowledge, because that's, that's my best hope for all of my students, is that they can do a better job than I did, right? And that they're able to interact in the world uh, in a better way than I have, um, as well as creating a beautiful place. Uh, so I always say, you gotta stay positive. Think about the net positive that we can create in the world. Uh, even though some of them are hard fought, it's always, uh, it's always worthwhile. Who's got a question? question yes. Uh, when you were working on the project, yes. when you were counting on leaves falling, yep. organisms on them to feed the fish, and then you planted trees that hadn't been there, what, in thousands of years? Yep. Were you confident there'd be some organism that would come and feed on those trees, and did they? Yeah, so with the Grand Rapids project, uh, we did research specifically to figure out what kind of species would be best for the fish. And as it happens, the deciduous evergreens, which is a taxodium, they, see, they have a lot of sap suckers. And sap suckers are they're some of the best ones for those fish. And so they're, they're gonna go and attack that tree, but then they, they drop their needles uh, in the fall, and those are the ones that then the fish will work out. I mean, we'll, we'll see. I mean, that one's still, that one's gonna be built starting in the spring. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, we use research, we, I mean, I have access to a great number of, of journals being both in academia uh, and a practitioner, so I use that resource uh, because that's, that's what we have, right? That's the logic part of what we do. Uh, a lot of times people are faulted, especially in the design fields, for just like coming up with crazy ideas. Uh, and that's not always true. I mean, there's a lot of design research that occurs within the design profession. But as a human ecologist and as a landscape architect, we design with living things. It's a lot more, it's a lot more complicated, right? You know, it's not just like planting a tree there. It's not, it's not just a form, it's a function that we have to design with. On the topic of the taxodium, were those also the trees that were threatened in the different area or declined in the different area that you had mentioned when, when we were talking earlier? Uh, those are not, no, but, but they have an interesting, so they have, the taxodiums have an interesting story, which is they, their native environment is basically uh, most of the southern coast, right? So Louisiana, that's where you're going to see these are, these are the big cypresses that you see that have the big knees and all of that. Um, and so they had a much bigger range depending upon when the ice ages come, they fluctuate just as any tree species does. They kind of move back and forth. Uh, and so what we do know is that the climate is changing, right? It's shifting. Grand Rapids in particular is gonna get warmer and wetter. Uh, and as that happens, and as you all, I'm sure are aware of this, like your maples are leaving, right? They're going to Canada. They're like, we're out, thanks. <laughs> right? And that's, that's due directly to, to climate change. And so in that way, we have to actually think about that. It's, it's not a far term thing. It's within a couple lifetimes that we need to understand like, okay, all of those trees that you planted, they're all gonna, they're all gonna go away. Um, and so we need to think about resiliency in that way. And it's a native tree in the South. It was a native tree that lived there millions of years ago. It was just wiped out by successive ice ages. Uh, it does not spread until the climate is right, which is a really cool adaptation that it has. So it can drop as many little crazy pine cones that it has, but it's not gonna become an invasive species. It's only gonna live on that site up until the time the climate catches up with it, which is, means that it will probably be adapted to whatever is living there as well. So there's kind of that, we're kind of thinking about those things as well, which is, um, it's just critical. If you're still planting sugar maples in your designs, which a lot of people are, it's like, sorry, it's not. You got like 50 years on that, on that, mm -hmm. and then it's gone. I have a question about that, that temporal piece of designing, um, yeah. especially with these, these more compact parks where you're, you're fitting a lot of ecology into a relatively small space, and, that, and, and the space is going to 
the demands in that space are going to change due to climate, due to urbanism, due to all sorts of things. Um, when you're working in such a small space, especially, how far out are you looking? Are you looking, you know, this is a park that's going to be here forever, or we're designing this for the needs of the community for the next 50 years? Or how do you think about time when you're designing these places? I mean, that is, that's, a, that's kind of an ongoing question, for sure, that we continue to ask ourselves, because there is, there's a material renewal kind of cycle, which is realistic. Like, nothing lasts forever. And nobody wants to pay for the things that almost last forever, right? <laughs> it's way too expensive. So what is it that we can do to create things that can be renewed so that there's options to think about? And that's another reason why I'm like very interested in as much wood as we can use. Because that allows for flexibility uh, in that, like a reevaluation, um, even though, so that targets us, you know, if we use thermally modified wood or, uh, or um, FSC um, hardwoods, like we're, we're getting into like a 40 year range, which I think is reasonable um, because maybe that does change. Like I, my park doesn't have to last forever, right? The, the point being is that the park is there, right? That's some of the biggest moves that we make and the things that I feel the best about in landscape architecture is that we convert something that wasn't an open space or functioning ecologically and we convert that into a space that does. So it's like the little, it's the little victories. So even the small ones count, uh, especially somewhere like Green Bay where you're like, that was a railroad. Like that was just a, a series of, of railroad uh, ties and it wasn't doing anything. Uh, and then we made it into a space that was performative both for the city, but also for, right, also for the river itself. If we can continue to do that, just like we are trying to do in Grand Rapids, continue to like remove the light industrial from the riverfront, restore the floodplain. Like we're we're reversing that tide, and so I think that's that's the point. There's just there's little victories and there's bigger victories. The planning work that I do, I can vision the big victory and be like, there you go, and then I'm like, that's going to be a hundred years before they're done. That. But it's uh, at least gives it gives people a goal, you know. And I didn't show much of my planning work other than the Grand Rapids project, but um, that is also, that there's different scales. So if we're doing planning, it's usually 50 years to 100 years. Uh, but people get very weird about 100 years. Like once you get outside of the lifespan of a human, like everyone's like, don't care, which is one of our problems, right? It's a huge problem. I mean, if we could get people to realize that, we could probably stop uh, the adverse effects of climate change. But it's, it's very, very Hopefully you all do, but like, those are the things that I get to think about with my students in the sustainable urban environment. So we're like, okay, if we needed to balance carbon, like how many trees do we have to plant in the Eastern forest to just accommodate for the carbon footprint of Boston, right? And then we'll, we'll do the math and we're like, oh, we need this many acres. Do we even have enough land to fix the problems that we've created? And so some of those bigger land use equations are a lot of fun. And I also teach another class called the Ecological City that also looks at that same idea where we say, all right, this is basically, you could make the best city that you want to, but it's still going to be made out of, right now, it's still going to be made out of concrete and steel, like huge carbon footprint materials, right? They're going to be operating in some way. So how is it that we understand resources in relationship to cities? Um, I know you guys love where you live. I would love it if I lived here too, but most of us understand that if we all just spread diffusely and tried to get a couple acres, we would use our resources just like that. So cities are really, really critical. Density is really, really critical. How do we make spaces like that livable? How do we make them ecologically functional? And, and how is it that we start, start to calculate what that is so that all of the other land uses that surround, because that, it's a philosophical question, what is the city? If the city is drawing from global resources, you know, it becomes a whole different question. It's not just a collection of buildings, right? It's actually this complex relationship between goods and resources and energy. It's, it's an ecology, right? Same, same thing that I showed you. You could just replace the cod with city. <laughs> it's the same thing.